Thank you for your interest in this lecture from Lectica. My name is Theo Dawson. I am the executive director of Lectica Inc., which has a nonprofit mission to improve education by changing the way we do testing. Changing testing changes everything. In this lecture, I'm going to focus on cultivating robust neural networks, a lifespan approach to learning and development. First, I'd like to talk to you about the main points I'm planning to make during this lecture, beginning with what many of my colleagues have called a no-brainer. And that is that if we wish to continue to thrive in an increasingly complex, challenging, and changing world, we need to have well-educated brains for the sake of ourselves and for the sake of our societies and our world. And what I mean by well-educated brains is brains that feature rich, integrated neural networks. And as I'll be explaining here, these are cultivated through action, reflection, and analysis. I'm also going to show you that by supporting virtuous cycles of learning, educators everywhere can help learners build these robust knowledge networks. And in doing so, they'll be leveraging our natural motivation to learn rather than imposing extrinsic rewards cultivating what we call reflective dispositions, and importantly, embedding the skills that we require for ongoing learning and development so we become individuals who can continue to learn robustly throughout the course of our lifespans. It's a small cast of characters. In fact, the model of learning has only two parts. The first one is the notion of the neural net or knowledge networks the second is the virtuous cycle of learning, which I will be describing in some detail. I'm going to begin by talking to you a little bit about what learning is not in our model. It is not seen as a process of simply pouring knowledge into an empty vessel and hoping that somehow all of those bits are going to coalesce together in a sensible way to create a robust and well-integrated mind. I'm sure you can all think of instances in which you felt that this was the primary goal of your education. And it is also clear today that much legislation about education holds this model, which is also often called a naive model of learning, as its primary model for how learning takes place. But learning is also not just about getting higher. And what I mean by this is learning is not about, or learning should not have as its primary goal, getting higher scores, attaining a higher level of development. Those are not legitimate goals of instruction, although they may be long-term ends, or at least some of them may be legitimate long-term ends. What learning is really about and where it takes place is in the brain, inside a vast and highly complex neural network. To illustrate, let's take, for example, the idea of a concept. Almost all of us have some kind of mental model of what we think a concept is and where it resides or how it resides in the brain. And for most of us, that image of where a concept resides is a place. It's a location, and it's like you could open a little door and there's your concept and you can get access to it. But indeed, the brain does not work that way because the brain is a dynamic, living neural network. And what that means is that everything that happens in the brain involves some kind of synaptic firing. That's why our brains light up in fMRIs. When we have really well-connected, robust networks, more of our brain lights up, more firings happen. So think about this in terms of the concept then. Let's say you have a concept and the concept is energy. When someone says the word energy or you think energy, any number of connections between neurons in your brain are going to fire. And basically what those firings represent is all of the places in your brain in which something to do with a thing called energy is connected. The deeper 
and the more robust your understanding of the concept of energy and the more developed your understanding is of energy, the more of the neural net that's going to be firing simultaneously. And this translates into an ability to use that concept in a myriad of rich and useful ways. And even potentially to have a network of firings that is unique to yourself in such a way that you can build a new way of thinking about energy that you can then share with the world. Given this model, given that knowledge is not a fixed thing that we store in a fixed place, but it's dynamic and it's growing and it's networked, it's really easy to go from there to understanding that when we are educating people, that this is what we should be educating. And if we take the neural network seriously, we're going to educate in a substantially different way because our goal is going to go from giving people the facts and procedures that they need to be successful in life to helping people to build the neural networks that are going to support their ability to be able to function in the world optimally. In order to do this, we need to start out at the beginning. We need to start early in life and make sure that children have opportunities to build those initial neural networks in robust ways. And an even more important charge, of course, is for our educational system to recognize that this is the object of a good education, the aim of a good education, and to take this seriously and embed practices in the educational system that are designed to ensure the ongoing development of, of robust neural networks. In order to do this, we have to take a different approach to learning. We have to take the approach that what's important here and now in this learning moment is that this piece of knowledge, this new piece of the puzzle that we're offering to the learner, is something that we're going to work on embedding into their existing knowledge structures in the most effective possible way. And when we do that, we are building a knowledge network that's not only robust in terms of the demands of the moment, but is robust in terms of being part of laying down the foundation for the learning that's to come. And the more robust the networks we lay down in the early years, the more likely it is that students are going to have the opportunity to reach their full potential. Laying down these robust neural networks in early life is akin to building the foundation for a skyscraper rather than a two-story house. We need to build those early foundations and each successive level in the developmental process in such a way that our current knowledge network can support ongoing development toward our potential as human beings. I like the skyscraper analogy for more than one reason. I like it because it makes it very clear the importance of building robust foundations. But I also like it because it brings back the notion of getting higher and makes it clear why it's important that getting higher is not the immediate goal. Because when people make getting higher the immediate goal, it's easy for them to neglect that knowledge network, to get higher in thinking about a particular concept without thinking about the consequences for the rest of that network, such that you end up with a brittle network that's incomplete. And when that happens, and we have evidence to corroborate this, people are unable to continue growing in an effective enough way to reach their full potential. As a matter of fact, we now have evidence that what happens to students who are being pushed too fast, too far, is that their developmental trajectories are flatter than those of individuals who have robust networks, and they top out, they flatline earlier than those of people who have robust neural networks. In fact, some of our current evidence suggests that for many students, their developmental curves flatten out in about grade nine. And what this means effectively is that if they want to learn new things in their lifespan, it's going to be a much greater struggle for them than it would be for someone who started out with a robust network in the first place. So how do we grow a robust knowledge base? Well, the graphic on this page gives you a clue. We engage in a cycle of learning that involves a number of different components. 
First, I'd like to talk to you, though, about what robust neural networks are. This is a term that we've already been throwing around quite a bit, and I've given you some basic idea of how we think about them. But robust knowledge is something that has a number of components that are actually things that we can target for instruction. The first of these is breadth. Now this probably looks very familiar to everyone because our current educational systems, if they do nothing else, focus on these components. Breadth is about how much you know, and it's about the facts and procedures that you know. So it's about facts, concepts, things, and they are important in any learning model. They're not something that we want to toss out. They're something we want to keep and keep in their place. The second component is what we refer to as depth, and this involves how deeply you understand what you know. The depth of our understanding is connected to how well connected our conscious and unconscious neural networks are. I've brought in some terminology now that I haven't used previously, so it's time for a little explanation. We have two kinds of neural networks in a sense, one of which functions unconsciously and with which we have very little conscious interaction, though we do have some interaction with our unconscious networks. The unconscious network is gigantic. It's unfathomably large and complex. Our conscious neural networks, the, the part of our neural network that we have conscious access to, is smaller and it works quite differently. Our unconscious neural network is fast. It processes things at lightning speed. It doesn't require intervention from us. Our conscious neural network is slow. It requires that we stop and we think and we deliberate and we consciously act on that network. And you know how long that takes. They're also not about just facts and procedures or how much you know. These networks are integrations not only of that kind of knowledge, but they integrate the kind of knowledge that is about components like our emotions, our emotional selves, our ability to regulate our emotions, our ability to regulate ourselves, are also part of what's happening in those neural networks. So we can think of the neural network and the depth piece as being about the whole self. The third component is quality, of course, because you can build a neural network that's a mess, where we're making all kinds of connections that aren't robust, that don't reflect something like reality or aren't optimally useful to us in our engagement with the world. So we need processes that support our ability to create accurate knowledge networks. And it's only when we can create accurate unconscious networks in particular that we're likely to be able to continue over the course of our lifespan to have intuitions that are what Kahneman in Thinking Fast and Slow calls valid intuitions. Intuitions that are a good reflection of either something that we call reality again, or what is useful to us in our interactions with the world. The other aspect of quality is more relative, and it's about how adequate your knowledge is, your knowledge networks are, relative to the task demands of the role that you find yourself in in the moment. If you're engaging in a highly complex task in a changing environment, then the task demands are going to be much higher than they are if you're participating in a relatively simple task. So it's important that our knowledge networks are a good match to the environments that we find ourselves in and the tasks that we need to perform. How do you build a robust knowledge network? Well, first, you need access to the high quality factual and procedural knowledge that's going to provide you with breadth. And what we mean by high quality factual and procedural knowledge is knowledge that you have or someone has been able to vet to ensure that it can make good claims to accuracy and reliability. And this is going to require that we as individuals build skills for determining whether or not we're looking at high quality information. In terms of depth, what we're looking for are frequent opportunities to actually apply new information that comes in. For example, through things like action inquiry, problem-focused learning, collaborative learning, 
there are a large number of existing approaches that can be used to provide students with opportunities to apply new information. And again, the reason that it's important for us to engage in practices that build depth is because it's through the application of new information that we have the opportunity to network that new knowledge into our existing neural networks in a robust enough way that we not only can recall that information later, but we can begin to use it to solve problems or to engage with the real world. And finally, we need to focus on the quality of what we have learned. And this requires regular feedback and intentional reflective analysis of what we've learned. What this component does is it ensures that we have properly networked the new information into our knowledge structures. It gives us an opportunity to prune out connections that we've made that really didn't provide us with that good match to our external needs or the external reality. And it allows us to reinforce the connections that are going to be of most use to us. And we argue that when all of these ingredients are present, we are building our neural networks optimally. And interestingly enough, when we do this effectively, getting higher just takes care of itself. And now I'm going to segue to a somewhat different topic. We're going to talk about the dopamine opioid cycle. Most of you have probably heard about this cycle within the context of addiction research. It's the cycle that is implicated in addictive processes. But what many of you may not realize is that the dopamine opioid cycle is our natural inborn motivational hormonal cycle that supports learning. Unfortunately, this cycle is hijacked in so many ways by things like addiction to substances, video games, sex, media. And after students start school, it's not as often leveraged in the interest of learning, which is what it was originally intended to support. I want to tell you a story about my own life now that illustrates the power of this cycle. I practiced midwifery for many years back in the day. And during that time, I was privileged to catch 500 plus little babies. And I was fascinated by the fact that every single one of these babies, without one exception, learned to walk. And the reason I found this so fascinating is because learning to walk is really hard. It may be one of the hardest things we ever learn how to do because it involves many, many instances, repeated instances for most children of falling down and getting hurt. And I have personally witnessed children doing that dozens of times in a single day. And every single time they fall down, they have a moment of despair sometimes. But no matter how badly hurt they are, even if they break a limb and have to go get a cast, they're right back at it. They do act like they're addicted to learning. They act like they're so addicted that they're willing to go through almost anything to be able to get to their objective, that goal. And that makes learning much more complicated than we like to think it is. So let's think about what we mean by the dopamine opioid cycle and how it works. Dopamine is the hormone that is called the striving hormone. It makes us want to learn, to achieve, to explore our world. So that explains why they want to get up and try again. And opioids make us feel pleasure when we get there, when we get where we want to go, when we've arrived at our goal. A, a release of op opioids just makes us feel a sense of pleasure. So you can imagine that if you get that dopamine opioid cycle going, that you can keep the striving piece and keep the reward piece happening. And that could just cycle on forever. But there's a catch. And that is that we have to feel the pleasure of learning or understanding something just often enough. There's some research way back in the 1970s by Bandura where he looked at how the difficulty of a problem affected students' interest and performance. And he found that if you gave students a problem that was too easy for them to do, that not only would they be bored, but their performance quality would go down. And if you gave them a problem that was too difficult for them to do, they would be distressed 
and their performance level would go down. But if you gave people a problem that was just hard enough in the Goldilocks zone, we say, then their interest was engaged and their performance, the quality of their performance improved as well. This is because of the dopamine opioid cycle. When the dopamine opioid cycle is running optimally, the difficulty of the task that's being undertaken, the goal that we've set for ourselves or that someone else has set for us, is just right for that particular context and that particular topic or skill. We call these cycles virtuous cycles of learning, leaving out the dopamine opioid piece because it's a tongue twister. And I can confirm from personal experience and by observing others that they are addictive. Once people learn the trick of how to foster a virtuous learning cycle, then they will continue to build those cycles for themselves as often as they can. So here it is, the virtuous cycle of learning in all of its glory. As you can see from the graphic, the cycle consists of three basic processes. Actually, it, it, it consists of four processes, but the arrow represents one of those processes, the arrow at the top. And I'll be talking about that in a moment. The four basic processes are what we call seeking. We didn't call this instruction because instruction is only one way of bringing information in. And for lifelong learning, of course, the, the skills related to seeking are the more critical skills. Because as lifelong learners, we don't always have an instructor that's providing that piece of information for us, that piece of the puzzle for us. And we think of the seeking component as a piece of the puzzle. If you think of the knowledge network as a, as a big, interconnected, complex, dynamic puzzle, you can think of every new concept or skill that you learn as something that fits into that puzzle, that gets integrated into that puzzle in interesting and complex ways. The second component is the application component. And that's the place where we actually have an opportunity to apply this new thing that we've learned to some kind of activity that will allow us to network it into our existing knowledge structures. We see that the application component is absolutely critical. When we receive knowledge without doing application, that is knowledge that we are very likely to simply lose. It's going to go away. We've wasted our learning time by not taking an opportunity to integrate that knowledge into our existing structures in a robust way. The first step in that integration is applying the knowledge in some way. And I'll be unpacking this more soon. The third component is analysis. This is the reflective analytical component as it applies to the knowledge that we have only recently integrated into our current knowledge structures. It's a moment when we say, okay, how did that go? Did the effort that I just made return the result that I had intended? Was it accurate? Was it a good mapping? Did the other people involved think that it worked? Do I have evidence that it worked? This analytical component is absolutely critical because it's the moment in which we can prune our knowledge base. And by pruning, I mean that we can disconnect connections that are suboptimal, that we already have figured out that doesn't work. And we can reinforce the connections that are optimal, make them even stronger so that the next time we're working with a problem that requires retrieving that particular skill or that particular idea, that it's more likely to be available to us because it's solidly networked into our existing structures. And there's one more piece to the cycle, and that is the component we call goal setting. This can be done in a myriad of different ways. This can be something that's a part of the curriculum. It's something that can be determined with a formative assessment it's something that can be determined simply through an analytical process that involves a conversation between learners or an analytical process that involves feedback from an expert. There are a wide range of ways in which you can get the information you need to recalibrate your goal. In the case of learning how to walk, feedback that, oh, when I tried that, I was able to get two steps further can be used to recalibrate and say, okay, so I'm going to do the things I did for step one and step two, but I'm not going to do that 
thing with waving my hand that I did in step three because maybe that was what caused me to fall down. Setting goals in the virtuous cycle sense is setting incremental goals toward broader goals. Broader goals, for example, would include the broader curricular objectives that a teacher may have or the desire to be able to prepare yourself for a particular place in an organizational hierarchy or for, for a particular job or a role within an organization. But in the case of the virtuous cycle itself, we try to keep our eye on the immediate next goal because by keeping our eye on the immediate next goal in the process, we're keeping our eye on the very thing that we're most likely to be able to learn next in an optimal way. And by optimal way, I mean in a way that integrates it into our existing structures and supports the ongoing development of a robust knowledge network. What kind of learning experiences are most likely to support virtuous cycles of learning? Here are some examples. And right now I have to acknowledge up front that this is not an exhaustive list, although we are working on building an exhaustive list. These are just some examples of learning approaches developed in the 20th century that are virtuous cycles. And that means that they can just be plugged right into this virtuous cycle. You can take them off the shelf and make use of them and know that you are fostering virtuous cycles of learning. This model that we're developing is not a specific model with specific steps in it like some of these other models are. It is more of a general model into which we can plug in a wide range of learning approaches that fit the criteria of the model. As an educator, you should feel completely free to continue working with models that have served this function for you in the past. What we're attempting to do is to provide you with many more models and tools that support these kinds of cycles of learning. And you'll notice that there are some very robust models here, such as Torbert's Action Inquiry, Bloom's Taxonomy, very, very important virtuous cycle, and Frethe's Dialogical Action, the critical theory take on learning that describes a virtuous cycle. And now I'd like to take a look at some of the elements of the virtuous cycle more closely. And of course, the first of these is the acquiring information piece. You'll recall that acquiring new information is, is the seeking component of the cycle. And there are a number of practices that can be used to bring new information into your awareness, new knowledge into your awareness. One of these is, believe it or not, didactic instruction. As much as we dislike the idea of an education that's composed almost exclusively of didactic instruction, it does have an important and legitimate role as the first part of a virtuous learning cycle. And then there are many other kinds of things we can do to acquire new information, including reading, watching, observing, listening, what we call library research, which is going out and finding out what other people have learned in their processes of inquiry, perspective seeking, absolutely critical and helps to underline the social nature of the learning cycle. From the very start, the learning cycle is fundamentally a social undertaking. It is something that even when another human being isn't present in the room, if we're reading, watching, listening, doing library research, listening to instruction, that's a social activity. It's a fundamentally social activity. We need the perspectives of others in order to build our knowledge bases. And then finally, and last but not least, self-monitoring. Without self-monitoring skills, we can disable the learning cycle right off the bat by being unable to hear or listen to important information as it comes in, either because we're defensive or because we've allowed ourselves to become so emotional we can't hear. So we need self-monitoring skills in order to know when we're in one of those states that's going to make it difficult for us to be able to attend to those bits of information that are coming in that may be of great use to us. The next component of the cycle is the action component, the application component. This is the phase of the cycle at, at which we apply that new information. 
absolutely critical component, as we've already talked about. It's the, the component that allows us to begin that process of integrating knowledge into our existing neural networks. And there are a number of skills associated with being able to do that. Even though integrating information into our knowledge structures is an inborn skill, as our knowledge becomes more complex and knowledge becomes more abstract, then we need to be building tools that are necessary for doing that integration more optimally. It's not just that we're applying knowledge higgledy-piggledy, but we build the skill for determining which mode of application is going to be most useful or optimal for a particular kind of learning that we've done. There are a number of ways in which we can apply knowledge as well. And these include things like applying it in practice, and it's usually the this step in the cycle. And applying it in practice can involve things like experimenting, building, and teaching, for example. We can also use this new knowledge that we have to solve problems. So we can network it into our system such that it allows us to operate on some of the other knowledge that already exists within our knowledge structure. We can connect it with what we already know by doing writing, engaging in critical discourse, discussions, what is now being called argumentation in the K-12 literature. And we can do things like concept mapping, which afford an opportunity for us to try to figure out how things connect and change our minds along the way until we arrive at a, at a map or a model that we're happy with. And finally, the act of taking a formative assessment is also an act of working with information because a formative assessment by its very nature asks you to apply knowledge to a particular kind of real world scenario. Finally, let's talk about the third component of the virtuous cycle, which is the reflection and analysis component. And remember, this is the pruning phase of the virtuous cycle. It's the opportunity for us to obtain feedback from the acts that we have done themselves or from the external environment about the success of those actions and take the opportunity to prune away the things that aren't working or that didn't work and reinforce those connections that represent the things that did work. There are five reflection and analysis skills. The first of these are skills for evaluating information and evidence. And this is a skill that obviously but plays a role in the analytical phase of the learning cycle, but it also can come to play a role in the seeking component of the learning cycle as well, especially when we're seeking information on our own. As I mentioned earlier, we live in an environment in which all kinds of information is available. Almost an infinite variety of information is available. And we need to be able to vet that information for ourselves. So it's very important that educators are including skills for evaluating information and evidence in many of the learning cycles that they foster in the classroom. And by the way, these skills include things like reflective judgment, critical thinking, and metacognitive skills. We also need skills for seeking and making use of feedback. We need to be educated in an environment that encourages seeking and making use of feedback so that we can develop those skills. It's very important to be engaging in virtuous learning cycles in which we make seeking and making use of perspectives a frequent requirement. And again, with respect to this skill, I want to emphasize that it's a skill that's of great use in the analytical phase of the learning cycle, but it can also be made use of in the other components of the learning cycle. The third skill is not so much a skill as a cultivated habit or a disposition. And it is the disposition to reflect. It's a disposition that's cultivated over time and makes it possible for us to spontaneously, almost reflexively, reflect upon 
outcomes, information, emotions, or events as they occur in our life in general, but particularly as they occur within these virtuous cycles. And reflectivity is important, of course, because we're not always in an educational environment where someone else is prompting us to do the reflection. In our everyday lives, where we do most of our learning, I would argue, a cultivated habit of reflectivity means that learning can go way beyond the classroom. It can become something that we're doing on our own and, of course, that we can take into our future lives. Fourth, we need an awareness of cognitive biases and the skills for avoiding them. By cognitive biases, I mean the kinds of biases that Kahneman talks about in the book Learning Fast and Slow. And I'm mentioning that book again because I found it to be a treasure trove of very useful pedagogical devices. What Kahneman does in the book is he not only describes the cognitive biases that have been identified in the literature, but he also talks about activities and practices that we can engage in that can help us to avoid them in such a way that we actually re-educate the unconscious brain so that it begins to default to biases that are more adaptive for the complex, more abstract world that we operate in today. And then last, but far from least, we include mindfulness and self-monitoring. These skills are critical to the learning cycle because if we are unaware of our own states, and if we are not monitoring those states and managing those states, mastering ourselves to some extent, it's really very, very difficult to enter into the mindset that we need to be in for optimal learning. So for example, if we are feeling defensive about the feedback that a colleague has just provided us about the success of our performance in a recent lecture, then we're, we're going to be more likely to reject that information. Mindfulness and self-monitoring skills, as we build them up over time, become marvelous tools for making us more open to all of the information that we may want to be able to incorporate into our knowledge networks and support our ongoing development. In future presentations of the learning model, we are going to be unpacking each one of the skills and practices that I have focused on in this presentation. Unpacking them means associating them with particular practices and ultimately with particular lesson plans, curricular activities, learning resources, the kinds of things that we're going to actually use in our interactions with learners. Well-educated brains have rich and well-integrated neural networks that are cultivated through action, reflection, and analysis in virtuous learning cycles. And that when we support virtuous learning cycles, we can help learners to build robust knowledge networks. We can help educators build these robust knowledge networks while simultaneously leveraging their natural motivation to learn by paying attention to the Goldilocks zone by cultivating reflective dispositions that will take them into the world as lifelong learners, and by embedding the skills required for optimal ongoing learning and development. And finally, I want to remind you that what we do here at Lectica is to build lectical assessments, and the entire point of the assessments that we build is to support the development of, of robust knowledge networks by engaging virtuous learning cycles for everyone involved, learners, mentors, instructors, administrators, parents, anyone who's involved in the learning process, by providing an objective diagnosis of developmental needs, the particular learning needs of a particular student and a particular moment in time with respect to a particular subject area, and then by supporting learning in the Goldilocks zone by pointing to the next thing that's most likely to be of interest and of the right amount of difficulty for the individual learner. And then finally, by helping educators and mentors to evaluate and increase their effectiveness by examining 
the amount of learning that's taking place in their programs as well as the quality of that learning. Thank you so much for listening to this lecture from Lectica Inc. on cultivating robust neural networks. I hope you have enjoyed it. I hope that it's been an interesting learning experience for you. And I wish you many happy and engaging virtuous cycles of learning.